tuned to listener sponsored non commercial WBAI in New York, 99.5 FM. And we certainly are here live in New York at WBAI 99.5 FM in New York. Shelton Walden here, your host. Good to be with you here. My guest is Mr. Nat Hentoff, a longtime columnist for the Village Voice and author of numerous books on the First Amendment, civil liberties, and uh, jazz, etc. Mr. Hentoff, welcome to Walden's Pond. Thank you, sir. But of course, jazz is indeed the expression of free expression, so it's involved with civil liberties, too. <laughs> Absolutely. <clears throat> well, let me just say off the back, first of all, I wish you a happy holiday season and a happy new year. I hope you're in good health, and I uh, hope you all the best for 2005. And I want to say that I'm delighted to be with you because you're one of the independent voices on the media, and they're getting scarcer. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Absolutely. Well, obviously, so much has happened in this year of 2004, and there's a lot to talk about, and, and I want to get to it as, as quickly as possible. But, um, and you've been following these events uh, very diligently throughout the years, particularly the administration of President Bush. Uh, but uh, a, coll- a former colleague of yours, uh, uh, Jack Newfield, passed away this week, and I just want to get your thoughts about him. Well, I, I've been working with Jack for, it looks like, a century to me. Uh, first at the Village Voice, and then when he went to other places, we always kept in contact. This was a guy, you know, one of the, I think one of the greatest compliments you can play a re- pay a reporter is to say that he's a muckraker. That was a fr- phrase that Teddy Roosevelt started invidiously, but it, it, it means a reporter who gets into the muck, who hmm. digs it and illuminates it, and Jack was the primary exemplar of that, I think, in the New York press, uh, going back to how he almost single-handedly exposed the danger to children of lead paint, and he kept on it. He's also the the reporter who found that a young man accused of murder and sent away for life didn't commit the murder. Mm. And he was one of the primary uh, exposers of the current saint, uh, Rudy Giuliani, in terms of his violations of civil liberties, both in terms of the Fourth Amendment with those squads that would stop people for no discernible constitutional reason, except that they were black or Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was just what a a journalist should be. It it is a great loss to the city. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It certainly certainly is, and he will certainly and sorely be missed uh, uh, particularly as we, uh, as uh, all this news uh, continues about the war in Iraq and uh, stories about uh, the prison abuse in uh, Abu Ghraib, etc., which is something you've been following uh, closely. But uh, just before we get to that, uh, what did you uh, uh, think about the election results uh, in, on, on November second? Uh, uh, what I thought was that where where were these democratic strategists, including the highly paid? consultants to have gotten John Kerry to run. And this was a man, he was an empty suit. He lost so many opportunities to really reach across the whole electorate of all kinds. He only glancingly and superficially referred to John Ashcroft and Bush on civil liberties. I'll give you one example. I don't think many Americans know that under Bush and Ashcroft and the Patriot Act, they expanded what are called national security letters, which allows the FBI, without going to a judge all by themselves, to send out subpoenas to various institutions like doctor's offices, educational places, anything you can think of, to get personal records of people who won't even know the records are being gotten. That would affect a lot of people. Yes. He never mentioned that. So I think Mm. the... The main reason Bush won was Kerry. Hmm. And the, you know, the Democrats, if they're ever going to regain power, have to remember, you know, people say, oh, they ought to get religion now, if not, if not personally, at least recognize that there are people who are religious who are not demons. That's yeah. a good idea. Mm-hmm. But they ought to focus on constitutional rights. And uh, I'll give you an example. that They are shell-shocked by the results in the Senate. And I know for a fact, because I have a source on the Judiciary Committee, that when Alberto Gonzalez comes up for confirmation very soon as John Ashcroft's successor, the Democrats will ask some questions and all that. They have already decided they will allow him to be confirmed. 
for two reasons. One, that they say to their supporters, well, you know, the Supreme Court nomination will come up soon, so we'll hold our fire, but also because they don't want to be regarded too soon as too obstructionist. Mm -hmm. Now, Gonzalez is going to be much worse than Ashcroft. Mm -hmm. For one thing, aside from his record, which is horrendous, I've devoted, I think, three columns to it now, he is, unlike Ashcroft, <clears throat> pardon me, not a confrontational person. He's too smart for that. Mm -hmm. He's very amiable. People who know him saying he's a nice guy. He's very manipulative. And he has even more contempt for constitutional rights than Ashcroft, which is saying a lot. I'll give you one example. Mm -hmm. He was the guy, as counsel to President George W. Bush, who told Bush in their memorandum to this, to these, to this effect, Oh, you can go ahead and arrest an American citizen and hold him indefinitely without charges or access to a lawyer and just call him an enemy combatant. Finally, the Supreme Court said last June, hey, he's, and Sandra Day O'Connor, who's no radical, said to the president directly in her opinion, you don't have a blank check just because it's a time of war. Mm -hmm. But the Democratic Party, which ought to be rising in force, against this new, uh, much worse version of Ashcroft is, is not going to do much. Do you have any reason why the Democrats have been so slow on so, on some of these issues? On what? Do you, do, you know, do you know the reason why the Democrats have been so slow to pick up on some of these issues? Well, the problem with both parties, with a few exceptions, is that civil liberties don't rise to the top of their concerns, because like too many Americans, and fortunately more and more Americans are becoming aware of what, what's happening to, to our liberties, but you know, one of the worst problems is, and this has been an obsession of mine, it's not taught in the schools, mm. not from middle school through graduate school. There used to be what's called civics classes, yes. and now they call it, what do they call it now, uh, anyway, government classes or whatever, Yes, and I've seen surveys that indicate that, for the most part, the kids will get in high school maybe one or two brief courses in the course of a year. So most Americans, or many Americans, this is diminishing, thank God, many Americans don't know what their liberties and rights are under the Constitution to begin with. Yes. And that includes a good many members of Congress. Yes. And the Democratic Party as well. It's funny, the, one of the main reasons that... Ashcroft was put on the defensive in the last year was that in the Senate, his worst opponents, his most dangerous opponents, were not Democrats by and large, but very conservative Republican libertarian, mm -hmm. for reasons that you know other civil liberties people may not agree with, they feel strongly that the Bill of Rights is important. Mm -hmm. And they knew what the Patriot Act and a lot of these other things, like National Security Letters, was doing to them. Yes. You know, I get the feeling sometimes that both sides, uh, no, no one wants to let the other side have an advantage on, on, on civil liberties or free speech. So everyone wants to restrict the other person. And no one sees the bigger picture of if you restrict someone else's speech, it, your speech might be restricted down the road, too. Well, that's true of the right and left. Yeah, I remember I got into, as usual, a lot of controversy when uh, people wanted to get Dr. Laura off the air because she was very hostile to to gays and lesbians, et cetera. But they didn't realize, and I try to talk to some of the people who were leading that drive, <clears throat> that once you do that, and they succeeded, she's practically a nullity now on television, though she's still on the radio, mm -hmm. that gives ammunition to, let's say, the more radical religious right which has a very good propaganda machine, and if some liberal got on the air and an antagonized them, well, that you did it to Dr. Laura, why can't you? Why can't we do it to this person? Mm -hmm, absolutely, absolutely. There's a couple of issues that, that have come up in the news. I want to get to, uh, and then and then I want to ask you about uh, uh, about a controversy at the ACLU. Um, speaking about the Democrats, uh, the Democrats since the election have uh, undergoing this uh, this catharsis, they, they're rethinking what they should be doing. And there was an article yesterday about the Democrats uh, weighing, de-emphasizing abortion as an issue and saying that uh, 
uh, the party should open its doors to abortion opponents and that candidates should be, make abortion a less central focus of future campaigns. Um, they, they want to de-emphasize this issue. What's, what, what are your thoughts about this? Well, the Democrats seem to ignore the fact, to begin with, I'm speaking now very practically, mm -hmm. that there were more Democrats in Congress when there were many pro-life Democrats. There are still good many now, and they some more came in under the election, hmm. but they lost a lot of these pro-life Democratic seats, which came from parts of the country, red states, where even Democrats, even labor union members, were pro-life. Mm -hmm. And by ignoring that constituency entirely, okay, obviously people who are pro-choice feel that as strongly and as ethically as the pro-life people do. But when it comes to, let's say, partial birth abortion, which means that in the very end of the gestation's uh, circle, you can take a baby, and that's a baby by then, it's viable under the Constitution, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and take it out of the womb while it's living, crush its skull, etc., and 80-something percent of Americans across the board think that's terrible. But the Democrats in Congress have repeatedly because they feel that their main base in terms of this kind of issue is the pro-choice people, they've con repeatedly voted against banning partial birth abortion, which, by the way, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was very pro-choice, yes. so he described partial birth, ab birth abortion as about two minutes from infanticide. Mm. So insofar as they begin to think about being... <laughs> just plain realistic as to what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I think that, that division, though, is not going to be healed very quickly, if at all, because, as I said, both sides feel as strongly as you can think of about that. Yeah, I, I read somewhere that uh, John Kerry caused some uh, shockwaves in the party because he spoke recently. He said that uh, he, uh, he, was, he met with a lot of people, union, pe union members in Pennsylvania, and uh, repeatedly they came up to him and said that he, that he needed to talk about abortion. Uh, I mean, they were pro-life union members. Uh, yeah, that's a, you know, Democrats, Democratic consultants, these overpaid guys, who they're paid to lose elections, they don't, you know, it's a myopia. And it, it's a true of the way abortion is covered in much of the media. It's not that people are biased as reporters. But all they know, most of reporters, at least the ones I know, and I know a lot around the country, the people they socialize with, the people they marry or have as companions, they're all pro-choice, and they figure, well, that has to be the mainstream. Mm -hmm. So they're unaware that there are other decent people who, for whatever reason, and they're not just, you know, uh, religious. I'm a, I'm a pro-life atheist, for mm -hmm. God's sake. I'm not alone <laughs> in that guard. Mm -hmm. they, they don't realize how heterogeneous this, this whole debate is about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. We're on WBAI in New York. It's 129 in the afternoon. I have a privilege of talking with Nat Hentoff, a longtime distinguished columnist for The Village Voice. We're talking about some of the issues in the year 2004. Um, let, let's talk about an issue you've been working on, which, is, which involves ACLU. Uh, it's, this is a very interesting story. W what's this all about? Well, the... The staff of the ACLU since 9-11 has done extraordinary work in illuminating what's been going on. I'm, they've analyzed legislation. They've gone into court, the most recent court victory, which perhaps is the most important yet in terms of international news of what we do and shouldn't do. They are responsible for the release within the last two or three weeks of actual documents, copies of documents, from FBI people in Guantanamo, from counterintelligence people, from Navy and Marine people who were so appalled at what our forces are doing in terms of abusing and indeed torturing these non-citizen detainees. And as a result, it's now been proved that the chain of command, what, what justified in the name of torture, what some of these people are doing goes directly to the White House and to Donald Rumsfeld and his colleagues at the Defense Department, particularly to Rumsfeld. Mm -hmm. Now, here we have 
Rumsfeld being attacked because he use an, uh, uses an auto pen, or he's supposedly insensitive to the uh, to the service people. Yes. But the torture thing, under this terrible 24-hour news cycle, it, it broke. It broke in the New York Times. It broke especially in the Washington Post, which is doing great work on this. And then it died. Mm-hmm. And nobody talks about it anymore. Yeah. Uh, so anyway... That's one. And now, getting back to the ACLU, though, as I said, the staff is superb. Uh, in my book, The War on the Bill of Rights and the Gathering Resistance, which is now in an expanded paperback edition plug, I credit them all the way through for their analysis. But the leadership, especially the executive director, Anthony Romero, and the president, Nadine Strawson, has been involved in covering up what the top of the leadership Romero particularly has been doing in the last year. Uh, first, to be exposed in a front page article in the New York Times last, when was it? Uh, July, I think, or mm. June. Mm. He, without telling the board or the membership, signed on to an agreement to not hire for the ACLU anybody who appeared on these watch lists, including those approved by John Ashcroft, of people suspected of being terrorists. That Mm. goes totally against ACLU principles, Mm. and the result was he wanted to keep $500,000 or so that comes from a federal charity drive Mm. where where this list was required. Now, recently, the New York Times again on the front page exposed that to get more money out of the ACLU donors, and they need that money, you know, to survive and to expand... The ACLU under Romero has been databasing the contributors, even down to the $20 a year contributor, to find out how they can get more money, hmm. uh, trying to find out more about the, you know, their finances, where they live, are they capable of producing more. Now, this is a violation, even though it's not the government doing it, hmm. but you know, once they're, you're in a database, the government can swallow that up, mm-hmm. as the government is now doing again. But not to tell your members that you're doing that, and not to tell the board until recently. Then, what makes it worse is, except for two, I must say, muckrakers, because that's my favorite term these days, (laughs) two members of the board, Mike Myers, who runs the New York Civil Rights Coalition and is also a board member of the ACLU, and Wendy Kaminer, They've been exposing this to the mem- to the membership, to the board, et cetera, and they're now, they're now being treated as pariahs because hmm. most of the board of the ACLU is being very complacent and, and accommodating to this. Hmm. Now, what's going to happen eventually is they will lose support, hmm. financial re- support, and that will tarnish the work of the staff. And the ACLU has never been more valuable than it is now. Yes. So my call that nobody's going to pay attention to is Romero should resign. Hmm. He's not going to do that. And the other thing is that in both times when he's been exposed, the top leadership has told the board members to not speak to the press. Go through the ACLU press office. Hmm. So here is the top of the ACLU trying to put a gag rule on its board members. (laughs) Very interesting. I'm sure there'll be a lot more about that in the weeks to come, indeed. Oh, yeah. We're on WBAI 99.5. I've been talking with uh, Nat Hentoff for The Village Voice. Uh, maybe with, if time for a minute, we'll try to take a couple of calls or two uh, for, for Mr. Hentoff. Uh, there's also another article here talking about um, uh, freedom uh, to speak um, about uh, conservative students are targeting lib- liberal professors in schools. Um, invoking, um, um, saying that uh, they're being... Um, that they're not getting uh, all sides of story from professors, et cetera. Uh, have you been following any of this? Oh, yeah, all over the country. There's, I, I'm a board member, along with Mike Myers, of an organization called FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. And we've been handling cases from all over the country of students and professors, both right and left, who have been intimidated and punished because they dare to dissent from the prevailing orthodoxy on campus. Hmm. Now we have a situation at Columbia University, which has been going on for at least two or three years, where in the Mideast Studies Department, some of the professors, not all by any means, but some of the professors, 
when they have students in class who try to question their views, and their views, which they're entitled to hold, obviously, are that Israel is, <laughs> is Satan, although that's not the word they use, mm -hmm. and they're oppressing the Palestinians and all that. Again, they can say that all they like. Mm -hmm. That's their right. But when a student says, look, I'd like to present a, at least a contrary view, those students are intimidated and humiliated in class. Mm. That is not academic freedom. Academic freedom is part of the free speech movement. And that means the professor has the right to speech and the student has a right to counter speech. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you're going to be silenced for fear of that if you contest the views of the professor, you're not going to get a decent grade. That is not academic freedom. Mm -hmm. Now I found out about five minutes before you called, and I haven't seen it yet, but I know the source, so I trust him. Mm -hmm. The New York Civil Liberties Union, I've just been told, has written a letter to the president of Columbia, Lee Bollinger, who is under fire now because he's done too little to do anything about this. He's points committees that are already prejudged uh, in favor of the professors. Anyway... The New York Civil Liberties is claiming, well, the students don't have any right to contest their professor's views. So mm. that part of the, of the ACLU is also uh, engaging in very odd positions. Mm. However, the students there have a lot of courage. There are a number of them who participated in a movie, a 25-minute film, called Columbia Unbecoming. Mm -hmm. And that has been shown not only to the press, and I must say the New York Sun particularly and the Daily News has done a very good job on this, as has the Times in a lesser way, and that's beginning to have considerable effect. Mm -hmm. Now, the result was that Bollinger, the president, finally appointed a so-called independent committee to look into these questions, mm -hmm. and I now have an analysis of the members of the committee. Now, it's, I think it's five people or seven Two of them have already in the past signed petitions to divest from Colombia's investments anything to do in favor of Israel. They've got a right to do that. That's free speech. But what kind of an independent committee, and the others, by the way, are on record as also being very much in tune with the professors who are intimidating their students. Mm. So this is a farce. Mm -hmm. And mm. it's interesting. I'm going to keep following this story. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. It's, it, it, on all sides, I mean, there's a group now called the uh, Students for Academic Freedom, which has close ties to um, David Horowitz, who's been uh, on this about... On the yeah, other now side. Horowitz goes too far. Mm. Horowitz, who is a former, you know... Um, editor of Ramparts magazine, a big radical in the 60s, mm -hmm. now turned all the other way around. But what he proposes, and, on, and sadly a couple of states I think are doing this, he wants a piece of legislation called academic freedom. If you get the government into this, mm -hmm. if you punish professors through the government in the name of academic freedom, whether it's Democrats or Republicans who control the state legislature or the National Congress, you are directly violating First Amendment. Yes. Because that's, I mean, when you talk about First Amendment rights, that means the government involvement. And Horowitz is dead wrong. That's, that's going to be a terrible development. Yes. What, well, the way to do it is the way these students at Columbia are doing it, and, and, the, and Charles Jacobs, who put together this film. All of us can protest the people who are not allowing us to protest. That's the way to do it. You don't bring in the government. Yes, yeah. You don't want, you don't want government re regulating speech. Well, it's one forty. We only have a few minutes left for um, Nat Hentoff, uh, longtime distinguished columnist for the Village Voice, author of many books on civil liberties. We're taking your phone calls for Mr. Hentoff at two one two two zero nine two nine hundred two one two two zero nine two nine hundred. Uh, we call, uh, get, get, go right to the question. We only have a limited amount of time. Uh, Shelton Walden here, Walden's Pond at 140 on this uh, 26th day of December 2004. Coming up at uh, 2 o'clock will be Ibrahim Gonzalez and his program uh, Radio, Radio Libre here on WBAI. Let's go to the phones now. WBAI, you're on the air. Hello? Okay. 212-209-2900. WBAI, you're on the air. Hello? Uh, yes, this is for Nat Hantoff. Yes. Uh, Nat, you were one of the great champions of civil liberties, and thank God for you and your wonderful writing and your book. But let's get down to late-term abortion. You know, in most instances, this is because the children are microcephalic, the mother's lives might be in danger, and uh, therefore the Catholic Church has been pushing with evangelicals all the horrible 
pictures of what it looks like, but it overlooks the basic fact that this is a medical necessity. So why don't you comment on that? I'd be glad to. You're right. Insofar as late-term abortions are for micro, macrocephalic kids or kids with Tay-Sachs disease who are going to die anyway and whose presence will endanger the life of the mother, there's nothing wrong with an abortion. But the majority of these, and the statistics came out from a man who used to be a, uh, an officer of the National Abortion Rights League, and I've checked that out in other places. There was a report from a, uh, a hospital in New Jersey and other places around the country. Most of these late-term abortions are elective abortions that occur because the women waited too long and out of their desire not to have a child get rid of it. So it's simply not true. I know that's what the pro-choice people keep saying, but the great majority of the late-term abortions have nothing to do with the kind of condition you mentioned, which, and you're right, you can't save the life of somebody who's going to die anyway within weeks, if not sooner. But that's not the problem with late-term abortions. And the man who does the most of them has testified in court that most of his patients are people who had elective abortions. Hmm. Thank you for your call. Let's move on for Nat Hentoff. You're on the air. Hello? Hello? Uh, yes, hi. Guy, go ahead, please. Um, Mr. Hentoff, did I hear you describe yourself as a pro-life atheist? That's right. Um, can you explain <laughs> to me how a man should uh, exercise authority over women's choice for their own bodies? Okay, the question is, whose body and whose life. Now, I'm a pro-life atheist because I can read biology, and I've also interviewed over the years scores of doctors, of physicians, who are specialists in, and they're, some of them are pro-choice, but they admit that life is a continuum from the beginning. And as a result, when you cut off a life that otherwise would evolve into somebody you can listen to WBAI, etc. You're it's not a rhinoceros fetus, it's a human fetus. And, yes, the, it's what, and wait a minute, let me finish. And the result of this is a cheapening of the whole concept of life. And that's why we the people some of the, the atheist pro life peoples are also against euthanasia and against assisted suicide, because if we're all gonna survive to argue with each other, we gotta survive. Right, but it's her fetus, and I think that it's her decision, not his decision. The decision is the human person, and the human person who can't speak for himself or herself is still, despite Roe v. Wade, is still an American. And okay. I'm talking well, about United States law, sir. and there is no... When you talk about the woman's right, once the woman has conceived, it's, she has conceived a human being which also has rights. I, well, respectfully, I respectfully disagree with you completely. I've been reading your column for years, but I will not be reading your column ever again. Well, that's called a great respect for freedom of speech and exchange of free information. There you go. You know, <laughs> if, if, uh, you might as well not subscribe to any of the publications I write for. Then you'll be very comforted in your own opinions and which won't be challenged. <laughs> Can you take a few more calls? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're talking I mean, I'm enjoying this one. <laughs> okay. I love that. Oh, I don't agree with you, so I'm not going to read you anymore. Oh, boy. <laughs> we're talking with Nat Hentoff here on WBAI, and you are on the air with Nat Hentoff. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hey, how are you doing? Fine. Go ahead, please. Well, why didn't the Democratic Party um, carry Edwards, um, the campaign manager, discuss a strategy of uh, uh, really talking about the... Uh, the heiress in the background of George Bush's family. Uh, you got your radio on, sir. What's your question? Okay. My question is, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay, my question is, um, why, why didn't they discuss the background history of George Bush's family? Um, his, um, why they didn't discuss the background of George yeah, Bush's uh, family? Yeah, Prescott Bush was, uh, was involved with the Nazis uh, doing his bank financing, and they didn't, they didn't bother discussing those things. I mean, the, the Republicans did a, 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 a tremendous job of showing the negative sides of Kerry um, and were very ruthless. But, the, but, the, but the, in order for Democrats to capture the White House, okay. they have to be just as ruthless and tell the truth about the Bush family. Okay. First of all, 
you have to prove this stuff. Kitty Kelly wrote a book doing exactly what you wanted, and you, you may notice that none of the Kerry people quoted from that book because a lot of it was allegations. But more importantly, if you're dis- going to discuss what really affects people, like health care, like civil liberties, you waste your time on this negative stuff, no matter who's doing it. People want to find out what the person who's being running for office is going to do, not what their father did. <laughs> I agree. Thank you for the call. Let's move on. WBAI, you're on air with Nat Hentoff. Yes, uh, Mr. Hentoff, uh, Leonard Cohen. If you have a country like Israel that has killed so many children, so many women, so many firing on ambulances, shouldn't people boycott it? Shouldn't people resist it? The, the data are there on WBAI, on Democracy Now!, on Beyond the Pale. The things that they're doing, the government is doing, is criminal. And many Israelis are beginning to resist this crap. So, so, so how can you object to people calling Show for a boycott? I couldn't quite hear that. Could you tell me? Uh, uh, well, yeah, let me, thank you. Yeah. Uh, 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 I said, go ahead. The Israelis have killed so many children, so many Palestinian children. They have kept pregnant women from going to the checkpoints so that the children or the mothers die. There's, there's, all, no, there's, there's, there's no all kinds of films. There's all kinds of data. Look, on, you want me to on answer, BAI. You don't have much time. Let me answer it. Go ahead. You're absolutely right. The prevention of ambulances with pregnant uh, Palestinian women is totally a, a, an atrocity. There's no question about that. I'm not uh, s- supporting either side when it's dead wrong. And as a matter of fact, I was writing in favor of an independent Palestinian state from the 1980s on. I once got an award from an Ameri- American, Arab American uh, organization. I'll tell you what changed the moral equation, which does not in any way excuse what you're talking about. You're absolutely right about that. But when the Palestinians, who have a right of resistance, started using suicide bombers, they injured their cause tremendously, and just two days ago, 500 Palestinian writers, lawyers, intellectuals, etc., who have been part of the resistance said, we've got to stop this, and maybe that'll stop. I'm not saying again that Israeli is without blame, to say the least, but you can't use suicide bombers any more than you can prevent ambulances carrying pregnant women from going to a hospital. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, full switchboard here for Nat Hentoff, and go ahead. let's take some calls here. WBAI, you're on the hello. Hi, this is Shane. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank, uh, I would say, Professor Hantoff. Not uh, a professor, for... I'm not teaching anymore. <laughs> oh, well, whatever. <laughs> uh, the article you wrote about Ms. Sagan uh, more than four years ago, December 2000, and I found it on the Internet also. So there are some marvelous pieces uh, of yours, obviously you're talking about other people, okay. who, you know, with whom... Uh, the previous callers may agree, and they can download them free of charge without subsidizing anybody or whatever. All right, but listen, what's your uh, question? But, uh, the question is, uh, let me just say that I'm uh, n- not, not an atheist, and I'm not necessarily pro-choice but or uh, pro-life, but I, uh, I like the fact that there are exceptional examples like you, so we can say, well, you know, not all pro-choice people are Christians or Muslims or whatever. But the idea is even some uh, pro-choice people are actually in favor of reducing the number of abortions. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a great uh, work that has to be done in collaboration with those people if they are really serious about this. Okay. I'm uh, one oh, of you're them. absolutely right. And for some years now, there have been meetings between pro-life and pro-choice people about how to reduce abortions. And that would involve, for example, getting... One of the things is a matter of, of poverty. There are a good many poor women who don't even get any kind of pre-birth counseling or any kind of medical attention until it's too late and they're at the hospital. And that's something that could be done across the board. And also what's important is information. People on both sides have begun, at least some of them, to agree that although the, the more radical pro-choice people are opposed to telling people who are pregnant information about what, what the whole procedure is and what the life of the fetus is. And, for example, many people who are virulently pro-choice, and there are virulent pro-lifers too, don't know that for years now there has been surgery on 
fetuses. Fetal surgery is now especially recognized all over the country, and if the fetus, for example, has some kind of impediment that can be cured, they know how to operate on it, but then the same child, or if you want to call it a child, I'm sure many of you don't, mm. but anyway, the same child can be aborted the next day. People ought to know about that, whether they're going to agree with it or not. It's a more complex situation than the slogans on either side have shown. This, we only got a couple more minutes in the program. Uh, 212-209-2900 for Nat Hentoff, uh, Walden's Pond, Shelton Walden, and you're on the air. Hello? All right. Uh, let's try this call here. WBAI, you're on the air. Hello? You realize, you realize that the majority, uh, the moral majority that wants to prevent uh, late-term abortions, they want the people who are, po who are in poverty to have children and to raise these children to fight the wars uh, of the status quo of, of the white Republican, white male society. That, that's, that, that's the plain, simple truth of it. <laughs> I mean, that's really something. You are now telling poor women that they have a responsibility to abort because otherwise their children will be forced to fight the wars. Actually, if the Democratic Party had done a better job over the years, no child would have been forced to, to get into kind of the situations that they're into now. Mm. No, the question is, each individual, each individual woman has the right to know enough to then decide. And that's what I'm talking about. You're, t you're talking in these wonderful generalities that have nothing to do with the complications of being human and having problems as to what to do that's right for you and for the person that's in your womb. All right, maybe take, take one last call to here. WBAI, you're on here. Hello? Hi. Um, you know, a cow doesn't have any consciousness, so we eat it, right? And a lamb and, and all I don't too much because I saw cows in India and they looked a little conscious to me. But in general, an animal doesn't have consciousness. A very early term fetus <clears throat> doesn't have consciousness either, self-consciousness. And what makes us <clears throat> more privileged to have life than an animal? But some people think animals do have consciousness, but that's a whole other well, story. Well, I said, I don't know. Well, okay. Uh, go ahead. But, but thank you for your call. The, old, the whole idea that you can get rid of a life because the person with the life in the womb, let us say, is not conscious, what do you do with people at any age who are alive, who are gone through the birth process but have a concussion or otherwise without consciousness for weeks, days, or years? What do you do with people who are severely retarded? Do you get rid of them because their consciousness doesn't exist? Now, I'm glad to hear these things because they so vividly illustrate why people do not think for themselves. This is group think. You hear this kind of argument and you pass it on and you think you're contributing to wisdom. <laughs> Listen, we have about a, 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 a less than a minute. you have any final thoughts uh, as we approach 2005? What's your hopes and, or fears as we approach 2005 in the area of uh, civil liberties? And, and, well, and I think the gathering resistance, which is quite real, there are now 362 towns and cities across the country and four state legislatures that have passed Bill of Rights defense resolutions telling members of Congress to look into this legislation and these executive orders and change them. And because there is a real coalition now between civil libertarians and these Republican libertarians, and if the media will wake up and use some of this material that's coming out because of the ACLU about the torture we're inflicting, not only in, uh, in Iraq, but Afghanistan and in secret CIA interrogation centers, then maybe we can do something to force the Bush administration to adhere to what they swear to protect, that is our Constitution. Absolutely. Uh, that's, 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 that's a lot on the plate there, I tell you. Uh, Mr. Hendoff, always, I mean it sincerely, always a privilege to talk with you, and I really wish you a very happy 2005 and good health and, uh, and all the work you do in, in, in alerting us to what's going on in our, um, in our government. Well, I'm glad you gave me the forum. But I hope I, you don't lose too many listeners because they don't like what I <laughs> no, say. No, no, no. I think we gained a lot of listeners. <laughs> Listen, best of luck to you. Okay. Thank bye. you for your time.